All right, Scooby Doo. I don't hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so um, yeah, this is not going to be about uh, JavaScript. Uh, this, um, if you see JavaScript during the next 40 minutes, then that's bad. That's really bad because it can only be the result of a bug that I haven't found so far. So um, before anything else, a lot of you may be wondering, why do these things with CSS? Why not uh, use uh, JavaScript? Well, simply because I can. And uh, I can't really do them with JavaScript. Or if I do them with JavaScript, they're going to be crappy. <coughs> and um, is it better to do them with CSS? In most cases, no. But uh, well, it's the only way I know to do better. And um, I'm here to show it today. Since um, I've just said it's not always the best idea, sometimes the code can be really ugly. And um, it's going to be so ugly sometimes that we're not going to look at the full resulting code. And um, what I mean by resulting code is mean, I mean, um, the code that's outputted by a preprocessor. So um, SAS today, and no prefixes, just clutters things. And um, not the exact demos that reproduce uh, the animations, but um, simplified ones. Simplified to such a degree that you can't simplify them further and still get something that somewhat <laughs> resembles the original thing. So um, let's start. And I know some may be scared by the word moth, but um, I really hope that 40 minutes later um, you won't all be sleeping. And I really wish I could look like that while I'm sleeping. I probably look like Shrek. So this is the first demo. And um, what the hell is this thing? Well, mathematically, it's a torus. And uh, what a torus is, is a surface generated by the rotation of a circle, or not necessarily a circle. Here I've approximated the circle by a shape. I don't know how many sides, I don't remember. And um, if you can imagine that uh, the density of these circle approximations is um, greater than it really is, then you can imagine the surface that is uh, described. But you all know what a torus looks like, because you've all seen. <coughs> because a torus is nothing but a donut. <laughs> and you have this thing. And between uh, two circles, the space between them is uh, just like the slice of a donut. So you take a knife, and you slice the donut. <laughs> and if you want chocolate, um, there's chocolate too. <laughs> so um, there are a few steps. First, distribute dots on a circle. Then distribute the circles on the torus. And then animate the damn thing. And um, this is my friend Boo. And um, Boo has a system of coordinates. And what the transform does to Boo is that not only does it skew him but it also skews his um, system of coordinates. And the same thing happens if I, apply, if I apply a rotate. Boo gets rotated. His system of coordinates gets rotated as well. And if I apply a translate, this obviously has different units, the system of coordinates also gets translated. And this is really useful, because if you want to have a chain of transforms, and you want them to have different transform origins, then you can simply put a translate between those two transforms. And what I mean by a chain of transforms is simply putting one transform after the other. So um, we should probably not torture Boo any further. Um, this is a dot, 
just like Boo has um, a system of coordinates. And um, we can rotate it by 30 degrees. And then we uh, translate it. And then we rotate it again, this time around the y-axis. And we have a second dot, and we rotate it by an angle that's 30 plus 30. And um, then we translate it, rotate again around the y-axis. Third dot, and keep adding 30 degrees to the first rotate. And this is how we distribute uh, the dots on a circle. Um, you can't really see them that well. Um, they're really narrow. And this is because you see them from uh, one side, from the lateral. So um, we can do something about this. And that's rotating the circle, the actual circle. So we apply a rotate on the circle. I wish I could type faster. And everything disappears. Is that normal? Who thinks that's normal? Yep, it is. But it's not good. First, let's see why this happens. It happens because of um, CSS property called transform style. Here we have some doors that are moving, uh, and they are inside a frame with a class of doors. And um, this frame doesn't have any transform applied on it, uh, is not, but uh, let's change that. And this doesn't look right anymore. Um, let's make it more obvious. What happened to the doors inside? Well, this is because of uh, the transform style property, which has um, they, they look so flat. Well, if I don't have this one, right? Like this, they look so flat. And this is because the transform style property has a default value of flat. But if we replace this flat with preserve 3D, then we have 3D motion again. So this is exactly what we need to do here. And we can see the circle again. Moving on. Uh, the code for all the dots on the circle. Now, that's a lot. And if you want to increase the density of dots, then um, the angle between uh, the dots is going to change. And we have to change the angle for each and every one of them. And we can make a mistake at a certain point, And everything gets screwed up. Which is why it's better to write it like this. This is all the code that you need to write, no matter how many elements you have in there. That's all, nothing more. Distributing circles on the torus. Well, it's almost the same thing, except we have a rotate around the y-axis, and then a translate, and that does it. Rotate, translate. Rotate, translate. Rotate, translate. And I'm bored. The code for all the circles on the torus, kind of the same thing. Again, very much repeating. And um, this is how we com can uh, compact it. You simply have the number of elements, and you loop through them, and uh, you determine the angle. 
the initial uh, circle with dots uh, um, didn't look like this. It looked a lot prettier. And we can make it uh, prettier by uh, changing the colors, having a different color for a different dot. Three colors in this case, so nth child, no secrets here. And um, we need to animate the thing. Well, that's pretty easy. We need to rotate the circles, right? Mm, not really. And this is because the circles already have uh, some transforms applied on them. And um, if we uh, use this animation, which brings them to this final transform, then they are going to lose their original transform. So what uh, we would have to do in this case is um, have this transform value as the initial transform, the from of the keyframes, and add more um, rotate, one rotate to 360 degrees after the translate. But we couldn't use just one set of keyframes then. We need to use as many keyframes as uh, circles we have. And if you have 80 circles, 80 sets of keyframes, mm, not really. That's why we can um, use another element inside the circle on which all the dots are placed and um, rotate that element. It doesn't look exactly like uh, the image because um, there are not um, all um, the dots of the same color are uh, at the same uh, level. But uh, we can change that a bit by introducing a delay. and I'm too lazy to compute. So I'm just going to change this value to something that uh, I can divide by 12, 12 being the number of dots on a circle, and um, minus 0.5. And um, with minus, it means that it has already started. It has already started by half a second when uh, you first see it. And for the second one. And now it actually looks like the GIF. So uh, this is the first um, example. The second one. Well, um, is uh, this um, an animated image or CSS? CSS. The, f uh, the first one was an image. Well, let's um, go through the steps. An element for each bar, element the animate uh, the height. No. The entire thing can be done with just one element. And it can be done with just one element using gradients. A linear gradient for each bar. <coughs> animate the background size along the y-axis vertically. So um, let's see how we get uh, some stripes. We won't bother with uh, the height, so not for now. Um, let's get the stripes. So we have five stripes. Each one of them is 20% of the element. The first one goes from 0 to 20%. The second one from 20% to 40%. Is that correct? Who thinks that's right? Is that right? Who thinks it is right? Hands up. Is it right? It's not. <laughs> and um, it becomes more <coughs> obvious if I increase the width. And you can see that the first stripe seems to be wider, but it's not wider. They all have the same background size. They all have the same width. Well. Mm. 
this is y. They actually overlap. And this is because um, of the way that background position works when uh, using percentages. For example, the 40% line of uh, the rectangle and this rectangle is the background rectangle. And a background position of 40% means that the 40% line of the background rectangle uh, coincides with the 40% line of um, the element. So it's not like the background starts from 40%. Its 40% line is at 40%. So this is why we're not going to use percentages. And um, this uh, shows uh, how um, to get something that starts to look like a wave. And uh, every bar is going to have uh, a width of um, half an m. And uh, the gutter is going to be a quarter. So um, this increases by 0.75 m, the background position every time. And the background size is just the width of a bar, horizontally. And um, vertically, we need uh, to think, what is a sine function? A sine function is a, um, a function that takes values between minus 1 and 1. And if we add 1 to that, then the values are going to be from 0 to 2. And 0 is going to correspond to 0%, um, and 2 is going to correspond to 100% which means that the unit is going to correspond to 50%. So the one that we add is going to be 50%, and then we are going to have the value of the sinus, which is 0.5 for 30 degrees, and I've chosen to go from 30 degrees to 30 degrees. Um, and we multiply this one by 50% as well. And this um, is uh, the sine of 60 degrees, and one is the sign of 90 degrees, and then it goes down again from 120 degrees, uh, and then uh, to 0.5 to 100, uh, from 150 degrees. So this is how we get the static wave. And the code for the static wave is going to start something like this, and if you have more bars, it's going to be a lot longer. But we can uh, compact it using SAS. We start with um, an empty list, and this is going to contain the background, the backgrounds, a list of backgrounds. And this is uh, S is going to contain a list of uh, background sites. This is the gutter, the width of a bar, and the number of bars. But the code is going to be the same, no matter how many bars we choose to have. So we loop through this, and we make the color depend on the position of the bar. And we take the gradients. They're going to be really simple, and we can make them more complicated if we want. And um, the background position is going uh, to be multiples of the width plus the gutter. And the background size is going to be constant, horizontally, and depending on the sinus, as I've said earlier, um, vertically. And if we move on to the animated wave, well, in the case of the animated wave, the height of a bar is not going to depend only on its position, but also on the moment in time, uh, which is why uh, we also have the time, the period of the sign, and also a precision. The precision is um, the number of keyframes we are uh, going to use. So we loop from 1 to p, and for each j, we create a keyframe, and inside each keyframe, key we have a list of uh, background sizes, which we then create, just like before, except this time, we have another term here, and t over p is how much time one keyframe takes. And uh, we multiply this with j, and we add to the value we had previously, i over n, for the static wave. And um, this is the third example. And spin it, spin it, spin it. This is from Tailspin, which is a Disney cartoon. I love classic cartoons. 
And um, this is also done with a CSS property, uh, with a CSS feature. Uh, in this case, um, it's pretty simple. We have two elements rotating in opposite directions. But how do we get the thing inside? Well, we get it with radial gradients. And in, in this way, we get disks stacked one on top of the other. And the central points of the disks are on the same circles. And an illustration of this would be the one in the corner. So how do we do this in practice? Well, first of all, something that really confused me at first when I started playing with radial gradients, what's this at 50-50? And I didn't really get how is this different from background position. And then I finally got that background position refers to the background, to the position of the background inside the element. And at whatever refers to the position of the center of the circle or ellipse inside the background. Because if I move this to 0, 050, it's going to be like this. And um, first of all, let's move this back to 50%. Um, if we have all those disks stacked in, in the middle, then uh, how can we distribute them such that uh, their centers are on a circle? Well, the position of a point on a circle is determined by two things. One. <coughs> is uh, the radius of the circle. And the second one is the angle between the horizontal axis and the radius. And the coordinates of the circle can be found really easily from this right triangle. And we have this, the x coordinate is r times the cosine of the angle, and the vertical coordinate is r times the sine of the angle. And we stack the gradients. And we have 50%, the coordinates at the center, plus the cosine of 0 times 25%. Because we take, we take this radius to be a quarter of uh, the element, which has uh, a 50% border radius. But um, there are two problems here. First of all, they don't cover the entire outer circle. And secondly, the stacking is all wrong. Because, well, let's see how we can solve these two problems separately. First, computing the radius. It's going to cover the entire circle if two consecutive circles intersect on the outer circle in such a point, like this one. And we have this right triangle here, which can help. So this is half the angle between the diagonals of two consecutive circles, which is going to be 360 divided by the number of um, circles we have around. And we know this radius, r, the radius of the big circle. So we can find the radius of the small circle using the cosine in a right triangle. That thing that can't be seen. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Fixing the stacking involves creating a cover on the part uh, where things go wrong. And this cover is going to be a pseudo element. And um, it has basically the same background, except the angle is different by 180 degrees. And um, the value of the cosine at 180 degrees is going to be minus 1, and the sine is going to be 0. So in this way, uh, we, start, we don't start from uh, 0. We start from 180 degrees. And then we go 180 degrees, uh, 225 degrees, 270 degrees, and so on. And this cover fixes the problem. Now, if we put it all together, we get a really simple code. 
And um, really, it's simple. We have 40 disks. The angle between the diagonals of two consecutive disks is going to be 360 over n. The radius of um, the big circle, which is going to be the same as the width or the height of the element, is going uh, to be r, this one. And we compute the radius of the smaller circle using the formula that couldn't be seen before. And we start with an empty list for the background and an empty list for the cover. And we generate the gradients for the background and for the cover. Just and this is going to be big R plus small r times the cosine for the first coordinate and um, plus times the sine for the second one, the y coordinate. And the same thing here, except there is a difference of 180 degrees. And um, that's mostly all. But we can do more things with these properties. This uh, is um, another of um, those animated images um, made with CSS as well. And um, this is really simple. There are three cubes. <laughs> there are three cubes, one on top of the other. And um, they keep moving. There is an animation that moves the three cubes down by the length of one side. And that it keeps repeating infinitely. And um, the duration of that uh, animation is exactly how long it takes to unpack a cube, a cube which is made the out of sides. And they're each animated to look like they unpack the cube. Oh. And uh, we um, don't really have to construct things. We can break things. This uh, is a shape with uh, 12 faces. Each one of them is a pentagon. And uh, we can break the shape into two cups. Each has the base, a pentagon, and um, five more pentagons around. And we can break it, and then we can recombine the thing. But uh, we can do the same thing with other shapes as well. This one has 20 faces, all triangular, and it can be decomposed into two pyramids and an antiprism. The two pyramids have uh, a pentagon as the base, and uh, the antiprism has obviously also pentagons as the two bases. And an antiprism is something like a prism, except you rotate one um, of the bases by um, half of the central angle corresponding to one of the sides of the pentagon. Um, we can do other things other than making and breaking. We can morph things. <coughs> uh, we start from the same shape as before and we start cutting the vertices uh, of the triangles until we get hexagons. And there are five triangles meeting at each vertex, which means that by cutting, we open up a pentagon. And the resulting shape is that of a soccer ball. Well, not exactly a soccer ball, because the soccer ball is obviously round due to, due to the pressure, but approximately the same. It, that one also has 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons, just uh, the same number of faces. And it's also this, uh, the shape of um, a pretty well-known carbon molecule, which can be doped with potassium to get a superconductor. <laughs> and um, making, breaking, morphing, let's go to exploding. <laughs> we take a cube and we split it into pyramids. We rotate them and then recombine them into a uniform shape, into a uniform shape. Uh, it's not a regular 3D shape because the faces uh, aren't uh, regular polygons, but they have uh, all sides equal, so it's going to be a uniform shape. 
we don't necessarily have to explode the cube. We, have, we can uh, take another shape, for example, the shape uh, we got previously. We can explode this one and recombine the pyramids into the stellation of them. <coughs> Enough with 3D, which you may have guessed I really love, because most <laughs> of the extra demos are 3D. Um, in CSS, we have linear gradients and radial gradients, but otherwise we can also have conic gradients. <coughs> and we can get something that emulates them with linear gradients. A lot of SAS. <coughs> also with radial gradients, we can do something that my dad calls Christmas lights. This looks awful. It's really hideous. Radial gradients look really ugly. Especially when they're small, they look really ugly in chrome. And as you can see, it's pretty laggy. It's a lot smoother if uh, you use um, box shadows instead of uh, radial gradients. It moves a lot smoother, the edges uh, look a lot better. And you're probably bored by me, so... Um, you might want to have a cup of tea. <laughs> and yes, this is just pure CSS. And no SAS. Really compact code, just pure CSS. And I guess this is all.